Anton Chekhov used to say that he could write a short story about anything. Skeptical, a friend of his said, All right, tell a story about that ashtray. Chekhov replied that he would have it by next morning. I mention this to show how even the tiniest things can furnish us with the raw material of achievement or reflection. So it was with me when I found myself slow cooking a leg of locally farmed pork and thinking about the reset, dare I say the great reset, of the international food system. At the heart of the globalist agenda, or rather the main excuse for it, is climate change. Now to be clear, I'm not denying the existence of climate change, which is a distinct scientific proposition, but climate change as understood by the globalists and their shills is simply the latest in a 40,000 year old list of emergencies that need to be dealt with right now whether you like it or not. It's millennialism, the belief in the imminent destruction of the world, except this time with a scientific flavour. Now, as any good politician knows, a crisis can justify almost anything. A certain virus that shall not be named on YouTube justified certain things that also cannot be named on YouTube and which dovetailed rather neatly into what the elites already wanted us to do for the climate. And so the concept of 15-minute cities, which has been around in one form or another since the 1920s, is perfect now. They can introduce that now um, because we're all prone to sickness and the world is going to end anyway. So the policy of restricting our freedom to travel is practically irresistible to these people. And that's why the World Economic Forum lent its support to the idea. Nothing to do with it before that. No interest in the idea from an a priori sense of just opportunistic. They've seen it. It's it fits in with their agenda, it dovetails nicely into it, so they've gone all out on it. And if you go to the World Economic Forum website, you can find plenty of material about 15-minute cities. It's pretty shameless, to be honest, but there you go. Uh, similarly, we've got the war in Ukraine. Totally upended the global energy system. But it's also proving a useful catalyst for net zero. It doesn't matter, and I, I should know about this because I used to write about it for a PR agency where I was the copywriter. Uh... A lot of our clients were in the green energy business. Um, it doesn't matter to these people that most lithium-ion batteries that power e-scooters and electric cars and so on, um, the vast majority of them are manufactured in China using coal. It doesn't matter to them that the rare earth minerals used to make them are mined by African child slaves. It doesn't matter that solar panels, which are notoriously hard to recycle, are often left in dumps to poison African rivers. It doesn't matter that wind turbines kill birds. It doesn't matter that the abolition of fossil fuels will impoverish millions, if not billions. Why would it matter to them? After all, you may own nothing and have no privacy, but by God, you will be happy. And so we come to food. It's somewhat ironic that we're only now coming to terms with the impact of gut health on mental health. There's an inextricable link between what we consume, how much we consume, and what we think. A kind of depressing example of this that I just um, came upon, apparently it's just been written about in a few um, few outlets, is the fact that um, our water supply system isn't designed to get rid of pharmaceuticals. So the female contraceptive pill, for instance, has been shown to leave trace amounts of estrogen in tap water. It's not yet known what this is doing to men, although you can only guess, but uh, alongside other chemicals it's apparently begun turning fishes into sex. They turn the friggin' frogs gay! So, symbolically, we are what we eat. If you control the food, you control the man. Stalin didn't need to shoot nearly four million Ukrainians, he just had to starve them. Our globalist overlords don't need to throw us in gulags for the effrontery of trying to be self-sufficient. They just need to announce that anyone who owns a chicken suddenly lives in a special zone in which allowing one's chicken to go outside is illegal until further notice. They don't need to collectivise farms Soviet style, they just need to minimise the use of nitrogen fertiliser in compliance with the EU's emission reduction rules. Now, big company farms can afford to do this, small farmers can't. And according to the European Union itself, this scheme would Quote, first be on a voluntary basis, but mandatory buyout is not excluded if necessary. If necessary. Um, I wonder if the Sri Lankan government said something similar before imposing the exact same experiment on its own people, causing an artificial food shortage and plunging millions into penury. The same thing's being tried right now in Holland, which is 
I didn't know this, Europe's largest exporter of meat and the world's second largest agricultural exporter after, I think, the US. Now, fortunately, Dutch farmers have pushed back with the newly formed farmer citizen movement making gains in local elections. I'd also point out that Holland's Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, or Root, uh, and his Minister of Social Affairs and Employment are both agenda contributors to the World Economic Forum, which raises the question, at what point does a coincidence become a conspiracy? Of course, this is to assume it ever was a coincidence. Hanlon's razor states that you should, quote, never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. Now, this is attractive to a certain type of right-wing commentator who is willing to criticise globalism, but unwilling to note either its ubiquity or the horrible efficiency with which it's being carried out. It absolves them of righteous anger. A clown, after all, is easier to laugh at than the king's regicidal brother. Faced with a conspiracy of predators, they see only a confederacy of dunces. We shouldn't be scared of using the word conspiracy. It was once an all-too-common feature of ancient classical renaissance, medieval Tudor and Enlightenment life, Guy Fawkes, for instance, uh, literally, I mean, that, that is the definition of a conspiracy, what Guy Fawkes was up to, and um, the words since taken on a series of hits thanks to the stupidity of 9-11 truthers, flat earthers and other paranoid schizos, as far as I can tell. Thus, conspiracy theorists became a get-out-of-jail-free card for anyone wishing to discredit suspicions deemed beyond the pale. And obviously this all has a lot to do with the Overton window, which I've written about on Substack previously. In the case of resetting the food system, however, Hanlon's razor gets it back to front. Based on the evidence, we should not be attributing to stupidity that which is amply explained by malice. We're dealing with a conspiracy here in the truest and most original sense of the word, a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. If stupidity plays a role here, it's in the fact that that plan is no longer really a secret. The charge sheet involves a staggering number of defendants. Last year's G20 summit, for instance, called for, quote, an accelerated transformation towards sustainable and resilient agriculture and food system and supply chains, whatever the hell that means. Uh, last year's COP27 called for a shift towards sustainable, climate-resilient, healthy diets. The United Nations Environment Programme calls for a 50% cut in global meat and dairy consumption by 2050. Bearing in mind, that's a global goal as well. So if you think about, you know, the, the, it's possible for the West, maybe a country like Britain or, or the United States or whatever, you know, you see the, the huge rise in popularity of... Um, meat alternatives, vegetarian um, diets, vegan diets, and so on. It would be possible for the West to make that transition if it so wanted and survive. But again, this is a global aim. 50% cut in global meat and dairy consumption by 2050. So what's that going to do to the world's poor? You know, what's that going to do to the Afghanistani uh, goat herder who relies on meat and cheese and milk and so on to feed his family i mean honestly the sort of latent racism of of these people is something that doesn't get mentioned enough but we go on the eu's um got a program called the farm to fork program and they want to quote accelerate our transition to a sustainable food system uh, all of these things have to be done at an accelerated pace of course the world bank has pledged to spend 35% of its 2021 to 25 profits on transforming agriculture. There's another favourite buzzword of theirs, transform, transforming. Uh, and then we've got Gunhild Stordalen, Stordalen uh, who's the president of the Eat Lancet Commission, EAT Lancet, which has ties to Google and Nestle. Um, she's called for a Davos for food. And then we come to our old friend Bill Gates, who and I didn't believe this when I first read it. I thought it was uh, fake news, as they say. But no, it's it's true. He's been investing in plant-based meats and now owns two hundred and sixty-nine thousand acres of U.S. farmland, making him the biggest uh, private owner of farmland in the entire United States of America. And it goes without saying that every one of these individuals and organizations 
have links of some kind or another to the World Economic Forum, or they're sympathetic to its aims. So, in other words, the world's richest and most powerful organisations are united behind the same food goals, uh, which they express in the identical language of transformation and revolution. What kind of a world do they want us to live in? What's their vision for the future? Well, it doesn't take uh, a Herman Melville or, or, or Shakespeare. It doesn't take a particularly fecund imagination to um, take a stab at guessing. I think they want us to live in a world in which localism is a distant memory. They want us to live in a borderless world made totally homogeneous by mass immigration and uniform policy. Uh, if this were Middle Earth, the Shire would be wiped from the map. Isengard would be Davos and Saruman, if not Sauron, would be Klaus Schwab. The gently undulating fields which characterise the English countryside and the flat, gorgeous fields of Holland and so on throughout Europe and beyond would be stripped of everything that makes them unique in particular. The farmer, as we know him, or her, a beleaguered group already, would simply cease to exist. Our food will be grown in laboratories by mass globalist corporations, and having deprived us of alternatives, they won't even need to deprive us of the right to choose. There won't be anything to choose from. And so in time, England, Holland, France, Germany, Italy, and so on, will simply cease to exist as unique places with unique peoples. The concept of the nation-state or of different cultures will give way to the economic zone populated by a monoculture. In such a future, there's not going to be a place for the local farmer who sold me my pork, and a good leg of pork it was. He happens to be my former secondary school physics teacher, and he, he was fantastic, this guy. I, I, anyone who wasn't taught by him, which is everyone who wasn't at the school, um, was, was missing out. I mean, he, he was absolutely brilliant. He didn't give a damn about the curriculum uh, or, or Ofsted or political correctness or anything. Um, he just stood at the front of the class and told us what he knew um, with a whole bunch of stories thrown in and hoped we'd listen. And he, he didn't really have any trouble on that score. He was really loud louder than a sperm whale in possession of a megaphone. Uh, but needless to say, he was the best science teacher I've ever had, and I still remember how to calculate force, mass, and acceleration. It's people like him for whom the policymakers should be slaving, not the other way around. And frankly, I don't have much hope for the short term if someone like Rishi Sunak, who can barely be called a British citizen, uh, given his tryst with the US and his wife's non-dom status, will come to see it that way. Uh, in the long term, though, I do hold out some hope that something as primeval as food will awaken something equally primeval in those from whom it is withheld. As Shakespeare's Caesar says, Yond Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous.' <laughs>